All right, let's move forward and get this started. So I want to welcome you all to the unique approach and value of the Operational Data Hub session. But before we get that started, I have a couple announcements I wanted to make. And first is to remind you all that within the Mark Logic World app, there is social sharing, so please do that. And then you can also complete session surveys within that app as well. So please make sure you're doing that. The, the feedback and input we get as a result of these sessions and how they're working help us as we plan for next year. And then one other note that all of the slides, recordings, and prezos that are happening over the next two days will be available and posted to the Mark Logic World online site, and those will be available in July. So now, without further ado, I'm going to introduce Damon Feldman and let him address. Great. Oh, Mike works. That's good. Uh, so yeah, I'm Damon Feldman. I'm, a, uh, I'm in the consulting division. I'm a solutions director for Mark Logic. And I've been, been with the company a long time. Uh, I think it'll be nine years pretty soon. So quite a while. And I've been through a lot of these data integrations and helped us to uh, uh, distill and gather some of the best practices around operational data hubs. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about some of my experiences and really cover this, this pattern. Um, well, that, was, that was loud. Wait, is that still? I was going to say something funny. You should use the operational data hub with a big voice. So, so I'm going to cover some of that, and, uh, but, but really cover the pattern at a high level so that we can kind of get a grounding early in, at MarkLogic World. And there's going to be other talks throughout the conference of specific implementations for data integration and, and bringing data together with the, with the hub pattern. So with, with that, first thing, what is an operational data hub? A and we, we chose the term pretty particularly. Every, every word means something. So the first thing is that it's operational. And that distinguishes it from an analytic application where you, often in a data lake or data warehouse, you gather the downstream data, right? You have your systems of record, and then that pushes the data downstream to a place that you do analytics on it, but it's not really operational. And what we say is it's, it, that's not to run the business. That's to observe or measure, analyze the business. Whereas the operational hub is, is really to run the business. It's a um, gathered data together in one place that allows you to make real-time calls, a, a very common one being what's somebody's address. If you're running a, a shipping job or if you just want to show someone's address on screen or ask them to confirm their address, they may interact with five or ten different systems in your enterprise, but you want to know what's their address right now, uh, and you want to make a real-time REST call or SOAP call to get that information. So it's operational in real time. It's about data, and our, our pattern is to expose those with data services. So unlike a relational product where you really link right into the table structures by building SQL calls in your app, you know, uh, you, you expose a data service so that the data can be shared around the enterprise. And then finally, it's a, it's a hub pattern. So the, the, the hub is a central data repository that gathers data from a lot of different places and also allows it to be accessed and sent out to all those places. So it's a two-way communication, again, different than the source systems move downstream through ETL and then end up in the final analytical system. So it's this kind of a topology. The, the problem that this solves and I hesitate a little to say problem, but the, the problem it solves is data silos, right? And that's a, it's a bit of a pejorative term. It sounds bad, right, data silos. They're not actually inherently bad. Usually a data silo is a product or a system that was built for a specific purpose. It's often very successful at fulfilling that purpose. And it might be a, a Cox product that's a great product. But it's focused on and limited to that one department, whereas there's a different need. There's an enterprise need, which is to see data across all the different silos and do what we call cross line of business operations and analytics and processing. So the, the way this shows up, that you have a lot of these data silos and you don't have maybe the, the right technology or infrastructure on top of it, is a, a slow, painful, wait, I have a pointer, a slow, painful, or puzzling rate of development, right? So you ask for something pretty simple, business people ask for something pretty simple, or it seems simple, and the response that comes back is, well, we have to upgrade our data warehouse to have some more data. It's going to take a few weeks. Or we don't have a system at all. We have to build new exports and new jobs to gather that data together in one place to answer the question. That could actually take months. And, and here's an example. And I'm going, to, I'm going to use this example, cover this in the beginning of this presentation. This is a, a state agency that I've been working with. <clears throat> and they have this exact problem. Who's on food assistance 
but can work and isn't working. And that's not a question that the state just thought up. It's a federal mandate as they deliver food supplement assistance, FSA, which most people call food stamps. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, they have to answer that question. <coughs> Pardon me. So, and what this means is a very particular thing uh, defined by statute. They're not caring for children or small children, uh, maybe as a single parent. They're not disabled with certain caveats. They're not homeless and they're of working age, they're not pregnant, there's a few things that go into that. Now, if they fall into this category, they're what we call an ABOD, an able-bodied adult without dependents, okay? And then they're subject to the work rule, and a new process has to kick in where they get called up and interviewed, or they come in to the, um, the social work worker's office and say, hey, here's what's going on with me, and my in-compliance are out. If they are out of compliance, they get three notifications and then removed from the from the assistance, they don't get the, the food supplement anymore. So the problem that this state has is that they have silos. They have a big mainframe, very mature, and by mature I mean very expensive to modify, right? Mainframe. And it's got a lot of data, including the disability and the age and some things like that. And then, because the mainframe is expensive, some enterprising group over here stood up a little SQL Server system to track work history and training programs. So they have a different data silo for that. And then another group, with even less money, just tracks things with Excel spreadsheets. So the information about who's been notified and who's in and out of compliance on which month, that's actually in a bunch of Excel spreadsheets that are farmed out and gathered among the various offices in the state. So this, this, this is slow, painful, and puzzling. Reasonably simple question. Conceptually, it's a query. The age is between this and this. Pregnancy is no. Disability is no, right? But in reality, it's a, a three or four way data integration problem. And this is Vernon. So Vernon, uh, maybe may from a different state, but he's in this kind of program. He actually went through one of these training programs where he was approved for specialized training, became uh, an energy retrofit installer. So he was, I think he had 50 job interviews, couldn't get any work, he's supporting a son, uh, really needed some, some money. Uh, and he got retrained, and here he is working on some HVAC equipment. And he's got a great quote. He's a success story. The sky is the limit. Life is beautiful. It's on you to choose your outcome. So this is when these programs are really working and the kinds of things that the, the states are doing for people. So here's their specific data flow. In the middle, we have the operational data hub. And the goal here is to create this middle record, the person 360 entity. This is really a case where, because of the pregnancy and the disability and the work status and the homelessness and the family structure, you need to know all about the person to determine are they eligible or not, and, and have we notified them? Now, to do that, what they did was they took that SQL Server Work Activities database, dumped it to CSV files. I think they do this as often as they can. They want to know that month, hey, are you working, are you working, are you working? So they do this very often. And then they, they built a JDBC interface on top of a DB2 mainframe, which does support that, although not that efficiently. So this ran for a, it was a long query against the mainframe. And just once a month, they pull the entire work queue. They don't want their work queue to change in the middle of the month. So they just pull it at the beginning of the month. And then finally, they pull in all this Excel data and you know, uh, slurp that into the system using this data loader. This was actually for them the um, uh, MarkLogic Spring Batch, which is another open source component. And the main component they used was the, the uh, MarkLogic Data Hub framework. And you'll hear more about that. And if you're fortunate to have made the, the, the early cut, you're maybe in the Thursday four-hour training. With, uh, with Paxton, who's here. That's Paxton. Talk to Paxton about hubs, because he actually builds a huge amount of hub stuff. Um, so this operational uh, data hub pattern is implemented by the MarkLogic Data Hub framework. And they use that framework to pull all the data in and then expose these services, fuzzy search, summaries of people, details about people, and whatnot. And for them, the real-time access was to be on the phone with somebody interviewing them, capturing their data, you know, are you homeless, uh, did, uh, did, are, are you still pregnant, have you had the baby, so on and so forth, marking all this down into a little structured record, storing that back into the hub, right? So that goes back into the hub, because now we have this cross line of business operation, and it doesn't belong in the work activities database, and it does, sure as heck isn't gonna go into the mainframe. So where do you put it? Right? You put it into the cross line of business data repository, so it becomes a read-write system. 
And then on the, on the right here, we have uh, progress and demographics are analytical functions. Progress is, are we clearing our backlog this month? Which state, which of the county offices is on top of it or falling behind? How are we doing? And the demographics are, wow, we just kicked uh, 500 people off a of food, food supplement. That's, that's rough. Why did that happen? Were, did they age into the program? They were in foster care 18, they turned 19, now they're subject to the rule. Did they age out? You know, what happened? So they do some analytics on it as well. So re really great system. Uh, here's a, a screenshot of, of some test data in the system. And each of these rows is a person. So we have Joe demo, demo deck, you know, demo data. And the, the color coding indicates going through the workflow process. Right? Have they been screened? What's the result of their screening? Have, has a final decision been made for this month? And have they been sent a notification for this month? So as those move across, the caseworkers are done. And at the end of the month, this should be all, all purple and, and yellow and completely finished. Uh, and, and it actually stores the PDF notice that is sent to them. So it's a totally integrated solution for this. So, so that's the state agency solving the ABOT problem. But it's an example of the pattern, which is a generic pattern, which we call the Operational Data Hub pattern. And here's the, a slide that you'll probably see in other places if you haven't already seen it that kind of summarizes the pattern. Um, on the left, we see that there's, there's me hitting the wrong button. On the left, we see there's different kinds of data that come in. Relational data is really common. Message data is like JMS and XML in REST and SOAP messages. That's really great data because it's meant to be communicated and it's already structured and hierarchical. So love that data. Uh, content feeds, there might be a flat file, CSV file, pipe separated, fixed width. Uh, might be an XML industry standard where you have you know, gigabytes or terabytes of industry standard XML data. Some kind of bulk operation. All that data goes in, gets stored in a staging database. The reason we tend to store it in staging first is that in order to build the 360 degree view, you inherently have to bring multiple things and join them together. So often you'll wait until two or three or five pieces of data have all come in and then join it together. Not always, but often. Then, and, and that tends to be as is data. So that's good for lineage tracking. You just have what you have. But then you want to get it into a more harmonized form. Again, the, we use the words very specifically. Harmonized is our way of saying you don't need a 100% fully baked rigid schema that defines every single field. But you might want to put a header on top of your record that has 50 fields or 20 fields or 100 fields that are of most critical value. And uh, maybe it's 50 at release one, 150 at release two, and 1,000 at release three. And you can, in an agile way, evolve your data model over time. But this, this data tends to be entities, entity one, entity two. Uh, again, for the ABODs, it was the person 360, the person entity with relationships to other person entities. You know, people and their children and their uh, live-in boyfriends and everything else. Um, and then that data is served out in a variety of different ways. And we'll talk about all the different ways. Mark Lodge is very flexible about giving you the data the way you want to see it, either by transforming it or providing this, these data lenses, right? You could have a relational or semantic lens on top of the data. So specifically for ABOT, recall there were the three systems, work, the mainframe, and then the Excel files. They all came in, and we stored those as is. Some trans we took the CSV and we turned it into a flat JSON row. But basically, no semantic change to the data. Very easy to trace whatever you have in the staging database back to the source system. If, the, if you want to, why doesn't this person have a social? Well, let's look in staging. Oh, the, the, their raw record came in with no social. And then you know. Uh, from there, it becomes immediately useful. This is an interesting distinction. I think it's interesting. Um, an, an operational data hub has some of the characteristics of a data lake. In that, you can put anything in it. Just like you could store any file you want into HDFS, you can put pretty much anything you want into MarkLogic. One of the differences is we index things in, their, in its native format the way it's built, you know, based on what's there. So if it's text, we'll index the text and the root words and everything else. If it's JSON, we'll index the structure and the fields. If it's XML, we'll index it. If it's RDF, we'll index it. If it's binary, we'll handle it in a streaming way with no indexing. If it's geospatial, we'll index that. So all of these, uh, the multi-model, right? We can take anything in any format. And that gives you sort of a big leg up over the 
a fundamental data lake pattern as soon as it comes into the system. But it's still raw data in 10 different formats. The, the goal is to get that person 360 entity with at least a canonical header, with at least some harmonization to make it easier to deal with, and it can still have all the other data you know, in a non-harmonized way, but you move forward in that way. Um, another nice thing about this is that as we move towards entities, we're, we're, we're getting, it's a good governance pattern. We're centralizing the transforms that turn it into those entities, and we bring MarkLogic's massive parallelism, uh, MPP, massive parallel processing, the scale out and performance capabilities to make this happen at scale. And then finally, we expose it. And, and for those of you who are using MarkLogic, these will be very familiar things. REST API, REST extensions, any way that you want to get that data out, build a relational view on top of the data. So for ABOD, uh, recall that right here where it says operational apps, that was the interviewing app where somebody's actually on the phone in real time with a person updating their data, putting their interview record in and marking them for in or out of compliance and storing their notifications. And then the analytical apps is where we're tracking the progress and who's being put on and off the rolls for what reasons. So the, the population of the state and how they're doing. And then downstream systems, there's no bulk exports at this state right now, but that, that can be done. Okay, so I think I've covered it pretty, pretty thoroughly. So it's a, just to summarize, it's a transactional pattern for real-time run-your-business kind of functions, but it also does have an analytic function like a downstream data warehouse. Um, you can pull the data in streaming or in batch. So you have a batch loader, but the, the left-hand side here also opens up a rest, restful port, so you can do a rest put and just put the data straight into the system as it streams in or comes off a queue. And then, and then finally, the harmonization is agile, so you don't have to build a full canonical model from day one just before you even start. So, I'm gonna, so that's, that's one example, and that's the definition of what the Operational Data Hub pattern is. And I think I just mentioned that we also have the Operational Data Hub framework, the, the Data Hub framework uh, as a tool, which is an open source tool that anyone can download. Um, and I want to go one level deeper. I want to think now about what are, the, what are the aspects of this system that make it different than other systems and can inform everyone in the room, all of us, in when this pattern is appropriate for a certain use case. And so I want to map this, this term, which is, which is not, um, you know, completely standard throughout the industry, at least not yet, to what it really means in terms of more basic operations like, like these, like moving data, harmonizing data, indexing data, and securing data. The nice thing about these terms is everybody can understand these pretty much. You can, you can talk to your, your father-in-law or your uncle uh, and say, hey, I have this system and it, it moves all the data from this one system that I have a lot of trouble accessing and it's always tied up and it's always busy and they won't let me query it. I move it into this other system where I can. Right? Anyone can understand that. I need to index the data. If data is not indexed, you can't access it fast. You have to scan through every record with a big MapReduce job, and that's slow. So taking this down to basic terms. And, and here's a chart that um, I won't have time to cover in too much depth, but I'll just sort of gesture at it. I, I actually have a blog post out on these first three, and then in doing this talk, I realized that security and agility are also very important, so I added two more. And you, you, could, you could read my blog post, and maybe I'll do another one on those other two. But very briefly, here, here down the side are some different approaches, uh, such as a data lake, which is typically a Hadoop structure, federation, where you do real-time query, and in, in memory in real-time, you try to make the results look the way they should, a data warehouse has been around for 20 or 30 years, you know, a big relational system with a new a star schema or a snowflake schema, a data hub, and then the operational version of that, the op operational data hub. And the Operational Data Hub really is, is built to address all of these needs. So um, movement is just what I said. It's taking data from one place and putting it in another. That gives operational separation so that you have full, free access to your data. Harmonization allows reusable data structures to be present so you can have reusable code and reusable training. So once you've seen the data from one system, you've seen the data from all the systems. Uh, indexing. Again, that allows real-time versus batch. Security, I don't think I have to explain, right? You just need that. And then agility. Certain systems, especially relationally-oriented systems, 
are pretty rigid. Once you build them, you've made assumptions about the cardinality of the data. You said, okay, a person has one address, so I'll put the address right in the person row. If that changes, I need to do a pretty big change, and relational systems are further burdened by being unable to hold two schemas at once, so they're less agile. Okay, so I'm gonna give some examples. Here's one uh, comparing the agility of this pattern versus a data warehouse. So agility, not so much for the data warehouse. And we found this at a, uh, uh, account, uh, a, a government office. They had a mainframe, they were trying to get off the mainframe. I think it was a million dollars a year to maintain the mainframe. And in order to shut it down, they had to migrate to this new Oracle COT system that they had purchased. And they hired a company, not us. They tried to do it and they failed. They just couldn't get it done. They had to kill the whole project, and it was a, you know, a real problem for them. And we, we were able to come in there and actually do this in, in six months. We were able to take the mainframe system and the new Oracle system, pull all that data together, even though it was about 10 or 12 different systems, and put it into one consolidated data access. Uh, 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 and one of the keys to success is the agility. We took a little bit, we took their raw data, pulled it in as is, but then we took a little bit of that and made it canonical. We put that in the so-called envelope pattern, and we put the canonical data in a header. And this is like the business state of every record, and the status of it, and who approved it. Certain basic facts that people needed to search on and analyze were pulled up to the top. And then those dates were able to drive a timeline view, and there was some geospatial information that was able to drive a, uh, a map view. So we were able to do a lot with some of the data, and, and you know, the rest of the data is like, like I think we said at the last Monologic World, be a data marine, leave no data behind. We, we did not lose the, uh, I love that, we did not lose the raw data. We, we kept it, we just didn't take the process hit of mapping it all on day one, and we were able to get them up and running very quickly. Whereas with, with a data warehouse, you need absolutely completely defined schema to hold the data. You cannot store something in a data warehouse, a relational data warehouse, if you have not modeled that column, right? There's just nowhere to put it. So that's a big advantage in agility. Oh, speaking of agility, I just added this, so it surprised me, because I put it in this morning. Uh, a couple days ago, our, our, our team, I think in California, Team 1984 won the OpenWorks uh, Data Integration Hackathon. Um, and they used the MarkLogic Data Hub framework, and they used exactly this pattern in this tool set. And, uh, and they got this, this, uh, this trophy, almost inappropriate. In, in its huge bullet-like shape, but um, <laughs> they won it. And I think this was uh, 12 hours of work by, by a small team, and they, and they integrated um, gray web data about peer-to-peer -peer networks and geocoded it and translated foreign terms into English because the user base was English. Really did a great job very quickly. So kudos to them and a great demonstration of, uh, of agility of the data hub. Okay, so the next one is security. Um, especially compared to data lakes and sometimes data warehouses. So here's a, a, a great, one of our earliest data hubs. This is the Fairfax County use case. And this was years ago. We've been doing a lot of these since then, but I think this is one of the first ones. And they had a security case where, that's actually where I live, in Fairfax County. And we're right next to DC, and there's a lot of uh, government people and government institutions in our county. Uh, so Supreme Court justices, CIA installations, Things like that where you don't necessarily need to know where their ventilation ducts are. You know what I mean? Um, so they have a, a requirement to expose as much data to the public as possible, but restrict it in certain ways. So certain type also complaints, right? Oh, my neighbor has an air conditioner on their roof and it's blocking my view or something. The complaint um, source is redacted. So what they did was they used flexible replication to take their internal system, and then they would replicate it outside the firewall where they were you know, they had a rule, no PII outside the firewall. Where they put it in the DMZ, actually, not quite outside the firewall. And they, they used a flexible replication security filter to make that happen. Um, one takeaway here is that when you integrate data, you actually have a higher need for security. You're making it easier for everyone in your organization to access data, and you're making it easier for everybody who might be hostile to you to access your data. And here's the, the graphic, right? The data swamp, it's especially for data lakes, you might have somebody named Sally who thinks that it's, a, you know, I'm gonna geocode this data and strip out the duplicates. She's gonna take a certain huge file split, run a batch job, and create Sally clean 009 and put it on the file system in HDFS. Well, what's in there? Is it safe? Who controls it? How clean is it? 
what version did it come from? All that stuff is ungoverned, uh, whereas if you have a data hub, you can centralize the security in the data hub process. And as, as you probably know, we have role-based security. We can secure things on the per record level. And now with MarkLogic Time, we have new abilities to secure it at the per element level. So really granular and powerful and industry, uh, uh, industrial strength security. Okay, another one is um, the federation approach uh, uh, versus uh, the, the MarkLogic or any really operational data hub pattern in terms of the, um, the agility. Um, so I was on the healthcare.gov project for a couple of years. And uh, many of us, if you see somebody with a MarkLogic tag on their shirt, there's a good chance they were on the, the healthcare.gov for at least a while because it was such an intense project. And the, the more successful side, the people don't hear about that much, is the data services hub. It's a little bit different notion of a hub. It's really a big federator that allows anybody doing Obamacare insurance to send a message to this hub and have it federate out to IRS and Homeland Security and figure out, are you, uh, is your income verified? Are you currently in jail? You can't get insurance if you're in jail. Um, are you a legal resident entitled to benefits? Various messages go out. There's all these messages coming and going through this system. And a few months before the system went live, one of the, the, the leads of, of uh, QSSI, the, the integrator, said, we think this might be, I don't know if they knew it was going to be a rough launch or not. But I think they knew. And, and he said, I need a system that tells me everything that comes in and out of my system so that I can answer questions when I get phone calls. And that was uh, very good foresight because he did indeed get a lot of questions. And, and unlike the other program, he was able to answer those questions. You know, for this insurer, what percentage of their API responses are returning errors? Are their message formats invalid or not passing schematron validation? What's happening with all of these messages did you even get these 40,000 enrollments that the state of Kentucky says they sent you? And he could answer all these questions because, sorry, I'll get to the point here, they took all the message traffic and were able to store it as is in MarkLogic, with some uh, exceptions. They had to uh, debulk and de-identify it by law. They couldn't hold PII, personally identifiable information. So they had to strip out for every message, uh, say, here are the PII fields, and here's some irrelevant stuff and have that stripped out. But what they didn't have to do was for the 10, 20, 50, 100 different message types, build some huge new model for all these message types. They were able to just store them directly in MarkLogic and get something up literally in months at a very critical period to be able to answer phone calls from irate people to say, hey, what's going on with X and have an answer. Really successful. Okay, so that's, that's the, maybe the top level set of criteria that I suggest um, people look at, which is when you're choosing some approach, and sometimes it's a new thing, like the, uh, a data fabric, a data refinery, or I, I don't know, something else, uh, some new marketing term. Does it move data and give me uh, isolation from the source system? Does it harmonize data so that I have common formats? Is it a real-time solution? And indexing is the thing to look for. If it's not a powerful indexing solution, at, like take uh, the Hadoop ecosystem, great ecosystem. What's sort of the default database there is probably HBase, pretty weak indexing, whereas we work with Hadoop, we have a little stronger indexing, right? Uh, is it secure? What does it provide, role base and so on? And then a little harder to answer maybe is agility. But going further down, let's talk about some of these other things. So multi-model, I think I mentioned before that a big deal with data hubs is to integrate data as is. You wanna take data from many different places and integrate it into one place. That's the whole point. If you have data in many different places, it's probably in many different formats. One system might actually provide it in a few different formats. It might have a relational database, so you can do a relational export. It may also have some message formats that it's able to send out, right? So you might have a choice. But um, you, these are, I think, all, if not some or all of the ones that MarkLogic sort of natively has built-in indexing and support for, and you may need them all. So the, the, the fact that MarkLogic is multi-model makes the data hub pattern much more efficient. And there's different ways to support it. You can take anything and write it to the file system, but that's not supporting it. Uh, XML has an XSLT standard for transforming it. JSON has the JavaScript language that natively handles JSON. RDF 
is queried with Sparkle, and you can infer things on top of that with ontologies. Um, geospatial data, you have to account for the funny oval sphere-like shape of the Earth to get accurate results. Binary data, if you're not streaming, you're probably not really handling binary as a first-class object. So all of these things are handled by Mark Logic, and that's one of the reasons that we focus on and do very well in the data integration space. Uh, so as I said, indexing it, querying it, using and supporting the standard languages that make all the models work. That's really the bar to set for uh, do, do, does something support multi-model. Here's a, here's a use case, an example. Um, one of our uh, government intelligence customers here in the US uh, has a, a BOLO list. It's, it's a be on the lookout list, you know, possibly bad person list, right? And what they do, they are very, very, I don't want to say fanatical. They're very focused on maintaining data lineage and knowing where their data comes from so they can trace it back. If anything was, was incorrect, they want to retract it. So they actually have a relational database, I think a SQL Server or something. They stream the entire binary into Mark Logic first and they track it with some metadata. And then they turn every row into a little XML row. And, and that's a semantically lossless transformation, but they put it in XML for better indexing. And then finally, they integrate it together into, into overall uh, person of interest records. Again, this is more of a person 360. I don't think this person is necessarily in their database. This is the Whitehall uh, suspect in a knife attack. Um, so they, they have the three levels all the way back to the binary. I thought that was really impressive. And again, that's because of multi-model. Uh, data lenses are particularly strong in MarkLogic 9. That's the ability to get the data out the way you want. You put it in in one way, usually with a document, right? Usually a document structure, sometimes RDF, but see it in different ways. So documents, JSON or XML come in, and then you've got different lenses, and in MarkLogic 9, these are using template-driven extraction. So these are now declarative, whereas before, you'd use some kind of a transform. And that allows you to expose it to the different users the way they want to see it, right? I want the, the relational view, the uh, ontological triple view, or um, a Sparkle query, or of course, just rest, restful uh, access with possible data transforms as built into the REST API. The thing to highlight here is, unlike copying the data into four different databases, this is an absolute transactional, everything works with everything operation. So as soon as you commit the document with certain security, both per document and per uh, element, that data is immediately visible in all these lenses, also respecting the security and the transactionality and all the other MarkLogic um, features. I mentioned before that there's this, that the word, very first slide, the word operational for us is really important, right? It's a real-time system versus an analytic-only system. So a lot of people integrate data to analyze it, not thinking that you can really integrate data in order to make it work uh, for everything. So here's the, uh, back to the ABOD use case, right? They had work activities and disability information and then all these Excel notices. Something they could have done was build a data mart. And that data mart could have been the real-time solution to support their new review application. Not a crazy thing to do. Build a regular application using regular technologies. Yeah, you've got one more data silo by doing this. They already have enough data silos. They would add one more for this app. But then, if they wanted to analyze it and really get the overall view, have to build all this other infrastructure. Have to add an MDM solution, probably. They'd have to build systems like maybe one to track their, uh, the progress of this particular thing, another for the worker productivity, and maybe another for the demographic anal analytics, or maybe a huge data warehouse. But they'd have to build all this other infrastructure to the right of the line that's all uh, separate and duplicative. And instead, they really can use one system, right? So this is the data hub system where everything goes into one hub. And then all of these operations from uh, finding a person, which is an operational task, and doing transactional processing, which is operational, real time, to SQL reporting and business intelligence or bulk export. All of these operations can go off the same infrastructure. And I, I, I really feel like we have uh, all internalized that it's just a natural thing to have two different data universes for real time operational and analytical. And it doesn't have to be that way. So these are the things that, that, that people can do. Access the documents, make a sparkle lens, a SQL lens, 
And then maybe for CSV, you might do your bulk export with, uh, to downstream relational systems with CSV, hypothetically. Um, I touched on security. I'm going to touch on it again briefly. So here's a bunch of systems. Again, this is a state agency, child support, child welfare. Usually, to protect the sensitive data, we focus a lot on firewalls and networks. And we, we call this the, the hard shell model of security, right? And the metaphor is hard shell, sweet, gooey center. Uh, whereas once you get into the system, like internal actors, not even somebody who broke in, but just DBAs and anybody who has access to any system, they all have different accesses to different systems. Sometimes application level access, sometimes database level access. And every one of those, the database and the application layer for 10 different systems might all have their own security regime. So what's really secured? It's all scattered and very difficult to govern and control. So by centralizing it into a data hub, you have one security enforcement point. The more you point people at the data hub, the more you know that the, the role-based security is going to work and give them only the right data. It's governable. Things are shared. Okay, speaking of governance, and this is, a, you know, herding cats, right? Um, I, I, think, I think it was David Gorbett who said recently, <laughs> Governance is anything that you care enough about to make a rule, right? Like, you have to secure health information. That's a rule. You cannot allow non-finance people to, answer, to access the bank account numbers if you store that kind of information. Wh whatever it is, I, I, I want my data quality checks to be done in such a way that I know that my addresses are valid addresses. So all the things that you want to do are going to be easier when you centralize them in one place. And the hub is, is an opportunity to do that, the hub pattern. So the richer the data is, the more checks you can do on it. Sometimes you, if you don't pull two or three things together into one place, you can't do a check. And as you do that and track this information, you want to track the data and metadata together. You'll hear a lot more about that, I think, at MarkLogic World, that Having your data here and your metadata about it some other place sort of moving separately makes your life harder. By putting it all together in one record, you can say, okay, here's my record. It has PII. It has seven uh, data quality violations, but that's okay. It's, you know, system will still function, and you track it all together. And temporal tracking, archiving, and knowing the lineage of your data. Okay, so to wrap it up, big picture, and we move on to some questions. Um, the, the operational data hub pattern, this really struck me uh, 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 maybe a year ago. It's very much an enterprise pattern. I came up building individual systems, right? I built a system to track landmines. I built a system to provision uh, Linux networks. I built individual systems for individual purposes. But now that I'm in this space, I, I realize the operational data hub pattern and data hubs in general, it's about making the enterprise work. You might have 10 systems, eight of which are great, one is mediocre, and one's kind of failing. And this is something different. This is concerned with how do I get data into one place to make all of these systems interact together, probably through common interchange and message models in my enterprise and the ability to centralize my data. Uh, so this is an architectural level sort of above the single system. And it's focused on the common data formats and common data movements that bring them together. Another thing about the operational data hub pattern is that it allows you to push data-oriented things down to the data layer with good data tools. So whether that's uh, harmonizing the data into a common format, uh, searching the data, uh, tracking the data lineage and tracking data as is across steps, whether it's securing the data, uh, joining data, those are things that sometimes people have a temptation, especially people like me who come out of this world, to do in, in the Java enterprise layer or in the, in the ESB broker. But they're really data functions, and this allows you to push them down to, to operate, quote unquote, close to the data at scale. And the, um, the difference, the, this is a pattern where rather than having separate operational and analytical functions, your operational systems over here and your analytical over there, you can really start to centralize what's going on and not have the, the duplication. Uh, finally, writing back and, and having it be actually a system of record for some data. So that's the big picture. And, and, and with that, I'll, I'll stop and I'll, I have this thing here. So this, have you seen this yet? This, this is a, a, a big fuzzy microphone. So whoever asked the first question, I'll actually toss this to you. All right. 
so in one of your earlier slides, uh, you mentioned MDM. Um, I mean, if I understand your slide correctly or your, your talk correctly, uh, it's kind of a legacy solution. But in my organization, if I have a lot of uh, duplicate customer information across systems, and if I bring them together in a single hub, how would I deduplicate without MDM? Yeah, that's a good question. So MDM is important, regardless of if you have an operational data hub or not. There, there'll be another talk, I don't know if to sit there tomorrow, on this notion of agile mastering. So there are certain aspects of, of mastering that MarkLogic actually does very well. We're good, very good at using fuzzy searches to find and match records and deduplicate them and track their lineage and know what merged and split when and who did it. So there's certain things MarkLogic does very well. There's some things in a full MDM suite that are a little bigger than, than what we do. Uh, so in certain cases, you actually would still have a separate MDM. In some cases, you would do something that really serves the business need within MarkLogic. And I, I, I'd refer you to that other talk for really the details on, on where those boundaries are. But it's a great question. Other questions? Oh, sorry, were you going to ask? No, no, no. Oh, okay. <laughs> sorry. Um, you may have already said this, but I just wanted to ask when it came to speak, speak, speak into the fuzzy box, please. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, you may have already said this, uh, but when it came to uh, messaging, maybe enterprise service buses, um, do you have any type of uh, special adapters for? Uh, JMS, IBM MQ, Tip, tip Ghost, EMS? Um, I don't know. A lot of people have integrated with those technologies. I'm working at a customer, my, most of my day being dedicated right now to a customer that is using MQ very heavily. Generally, because all of these integration bus adapter technologies are very good at reaching out over HTTP and REST and SOAP, mm -hmm. they just plug in very naturally. There may also be something in the open source community or that the MarkLogic consultants know about that makes it specifically easy for those. So overall, it's not a big challenge, and I don't know if there's, a, if there's a, a, an existing tool. There we go. All right, so my question is, <clears throat> at, the staging, at the staging phase, so uh, the, you take the raw data as is, right? Such think about there are two soil, and uh, they all have the social uh, security number, right? The first one without leading zero, the second one with leading zero. So when harmonize that or index that, how mark logic deal with that? Because if you didn't take care of that, it's like two different I index, which should be the same, right? Yeah, that's uh, great. So both the state, let me, let me flip all the way back to one of those diagrams, okay, we'll just use this one. Um, so usually in staging, the data is kept really exactly as is. Both staging and final, both in the Data Hub framework, which sort of gives you plugins to do this very quickly, but in the pattern is to use an envelope on both. And the envelope pattern isn't in this talk, but that's where you take your main data and you put it in one place, and you put a header on top of it for other things you may need. So if you need to normalize some keys, you, you would probably put those in the header in the staging database. So your main body is still really as is, but you've got normalized keys at the top. And normally, normally, typically, you don't do very much normalization or canonicalization at all in staging, but because you need keys to join things together into the final record, that's exactly the place where you, where you would do a little bit of um, uh, uh, canonicalizing the keys. So just like partial normalization for the keys to join. Or the keys are, are the only place I can think of offhand. Usually the metadata and the header and staging is where did the data come from, what batch did it come from, can I link it to a batch manifest that I may have uploaded, what's the data type. But a few things like key normalization is a great idea to do in staging. Okay, thanks. Thanks for the question. But in what you're describing here, in what you're describing here that essentially harmonization or whatever it's still operating on the exact same document itself. It's just growing the document specification. You don't have a separate staging area and a separate final area. Do you, or, or it, what's, what is the pattern? Because the, yeah. the raw record should carry the canonical representation attached to it as well, right? 
often, very often, your final record will have the original data as part of that record. Not always. Um, not always, but, but often. So it really depends on the business case. Sometimes you're all about speed and serving the data. Check time here. You're all about speed and serving the data as fast as possible out of final, and then you really want a minimal lightweight record in final. And because you have a link back to the raw data in stage, which are two different logical collections, mm -hmm. they're structured as morphologic databases, which is a little different than an Oracle database. So it's two different logical collections. The link is often enough. And sometimes people will carry the raw data forward into the final. We just have a couple of minutes. Uh, gentleman behind you, could you, could you grab that so that we, we are recording. So uh, if you speak into the mic, people can hear the So question. when we're talking about that uh, harmonization layer there, yeah. you could be joining, you know, you're, you're going to make decisions on which of those original source documents you're going to join together based on your usage pattern. Like, right? I mean, you could be saying, okay, when I do a search, I search for this, but I always return this set of documents with it, you know, within my response. Let, let me give a quick example that may clear, clarify it. So at, at, at some places, I'm, I'm looking at some people in the room, we, we might take a, a pharmacy claim for an insurance company and a medical claim and a dental claim and pull them all together into one claims history for a person. Uh, we might take their, their preferences of how they're communicated from their dental plan and their preferences, you know, email only from their medical plan and combine it into one preference central controller. So, so that's the kind of thing that tends to get harmonized together into one uh, uh, best, most trusted set of values for the person. Does that guide the question? Or, or I think it? so. Because, yeah, because on the ingestion side, those are going to be completely separate systems, therefore completely separate documents in your staging database. Yes, exactly. And then in that harmonization, you'll have an envelope that holds together two or three documents because you always use them that way. Absolutely. And, and it could be keep it all, or there could be a little survivorship rule in the harmonization transform. And um, the, uh, the Data Hub framework, which I hope you see in other talks, has specific plugins. And the first one's a collector <coughs> to say, for all of the unique person IDs, here's the data I want to grab and snap it together into one, into one document. But you can't know that until you start to, to actually use your data, <laughs> right? We have to know something about your data to do it, yeah. But you can knowledge. keep on changing and evolving that. And you can keep changing and evolving that, absolutely. Especially if, as the other gentleman said, your headers have the key join keys, then even if the body changes, as long as you're putting the right join keys in the top, you'll be able to do the work properly. I, I got the, the sign in the back. I think we're just out of time. So I'm here and happy to talk Data Hubs forever. And I thank you all so much for coming and, and listening to me and being at Morphologic World. Thank you very much.